thank you all for joining um, our meeting of the Baltimore <coughs> Regional Bike and Pedestrian Advisory Group. Um, Eric Lashinsky from City of Annapolis, I'm the chair. Um, everybody's beating the heat. Um, so I'm just gonna uh, ask Charlene to do a roll call um, to see who's here. Great, so we already got City of Annapolis, um, Anne Arundel County. Baltimore City. Hi, I'm here. Thanks. Uh, Baltimore County. Present. Carroll County. Um, here, Claire Stewart. Hartford County. Here. Howard County. I think Chris isn't here today. Heard. Uh, Queen here. Anne's No, this is Pat Smith. Oh, Patrick. Oh, thank Christy you. Hall. Yep, oh, no great. problem. Thank you. Uh, Queen Anne's County. Here. And Maryland Department of the Environment. Here. Maryland Department of Planning. Uh, MDOT, Maryland Highway Safety Office. And then MDOT, Maryland Transit Administration. And MDOT, State Highway Administration. Here. Great. And then MDOT Secretary's Office. Present. And I also have um, two new interns who are sitting in on this meeting as well today. Thanks. Great. Well, they, if you guys want to introduce yourself, you're welcome to. And then um, any any guests are also welcome to introduce themselves. Um, anybody, any guests want to introduce themselves? I'm Robert Capper with Arlington County, Virginia, Department of Parks and Recreation. Thank you for being here. Hey, everyone. This is Alan Gonzalez. I'm a transportation planner with Arlington County, Department of Environmental Services. Thank you for being here. Let's see. Anybody? I saw... uh, I saw Adi Bakken was trying to introduce himself, but I don't know, he must be having trouble with his mic. He was speaking, but we couldn't hear him. Um, so Adi Bakken is one of our interns at MDOT. Uh, so please give me some kind of uh, sense of um, what is its, its purpose? Uh, what happens right. if I don't do it right away? What happens if I do it right away? I, I don't know. So Hey, Francine. Right. Francine. Sorry. I think you may need to mute. Yeah, I got it. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, we can move on to the um, the next highly anticipated part of our agenda, the approval of the minutes. Um, uh, Charlene sent those out last week. Hopefully everybody glanced over those. Um, can I get a motion to approve the minutes from the last meeting? Motion to approve since no one else is. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> can I get a second? I guess I, I can probably second. Okay. All right. Thank you, Claire. Um, I guess Charlene is going to go through and we'll do the roll call in the minutes. You're muted, oh, actually, Charlene. Actually, I think we can just do we can just do a, a I. Um, everybody in, um, who wishes to approve the minutes, please say I. 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 Any nays, please say nay at this time. Okay. We have approved the minutes. Thank you. Um, so we, we have, a, as usual, we have a, a series of guest presentations for the, for the group. Um, really happy to have folks from Arlington County here to talk about their trail pavement condition index. Um, if uh, the two presenters could please unmute and just introduce yourselves again um, 
and I think Charlene, you're going to share the presentation on your screen. Is that right? There you go. All right. Thank, thank you for being here. Yeah, hey guys, thanks for having us. Uh, my name is Alan Gonzalez. I'm a transportation planner with uh, Arlington County DES. I manage projects that uh, improve our trail network, uh, bike uh, bike lane projects and sidewalks throughout the county. And I'm joined by uh, Mr. Bob Capper, who can introduce himself. Hi, uh, Robert Capper. I am the Capital Asset Manager in the Park Development Division of uh, the Department of Parks and Recreation for Arlington County, Virginia. Cool. Thanks, Bob. And uh, th thanks to, to, to everyone for uh, inviting us to this call. Uh, we've been having this conversation with multiple organizations throughout the region, uh, most recently with the Metropolitan Washington Council of Governments uh, with their Bike Pet Subcommittee. And there's been a lot of excitement for this, uh, for this uh, new scoring system that we've been rolling out for the past few years. And it's, we're, we're excited to share this with, with the, the Baltimore region as well. Um, yeah, just uh, if you can go to the next slide, please. Yeah, so just uh, I'm going to introduce our scoring system. I'll give some background as to where this came from, what, why we started doing this in Arlington County, uh, and introducing the PCI index that we traditionally used for our roadway system, but we've expanded to our trails network, um, and then describing how we uh, attain the scoring and how we apply it locally, and then share some lessons learned uh, that could um, Hopefully, inspire some similar scoring uh, in the Baltimore region. Uh, next slide. So, uh, just uh, some background. If, if folks aren't familiar with Arlington or or the other, on the other side of the Potomac River from DC, from the district, um, we have about forty eight miles, give or take, in the county, uh, but only thirty five miles are maintained by the the county uh, government. Uh, a lot of a lot of these are, you know, for example, the Mount Vernon Trail is, which runs parallel to the Potomac and uh, the National Airport, is is actually maintained by the National Park Service, and there's other, you know, other organizations that manage the trails, and especially especially some that are more regionally focused, more state focused, but overall, uh, we have about 35 miles of, of tra trails in the county. And uh, they, they, they vary depending on context. Some are parallel with natural resources, such as the Four Mile Run, which is a creek that runs uh, north to south. And then there's some that are parallel to some of our uh, highways and freeways, such as the Custis Trail and the Arlington Boulevard Trail. Um, and you know, as you can see, like they they, uh, they they go mostly east to west, north to south. And over the past few years, we're trying to uh, create uh, more connections between them, uh, especially in areas that are uh, more uh, have equ equity concerns and equ equity emphasis areas, trying our best to connect more of these activity centers together with schools and parks and what have you. Oh uh, yeah, next slide. Uh, so some background um, as to wh why we started scoring our trail conditions. Uh, back in 2019, we adopted our public spaces master plan, which is our long range uh, parks and recreation plan for the county. Um, and over the course of the study, uh, over the course of the planning effort, we did some surveys, reached out to the community, and, it came, and time and time again, uh, f folks in the, in the community kept saying how important the trail system was to them, That's not just for recreation purposes, but for, you know, going to the grocery store, going to work, uh, go, dropping their kids off at school, uh, trails, and, and even unpaved trails were, were huge community assets that uh, the, that folks kept uh, bringing up during engagement. Per, um, and it, it, it even just not not just from talking to folks, but even from looking at our own data from our trail counters, um, these trails are heavily used, uh, pretty pretty heavily compared to like other places in the in the country. Uh, we do a lot of coordination with uh, the Portland State University with their trek program. And it's pretty astounding at how many folks are, are using the trails, walking and biking and rolling, uh, compared to other places like Portland and Minneapolis and Matthew. Uh, so these are just numbers from the past week, um, and it, it's it's pretty surprising how busy the trails are, even given uh, how hot it is outside. Uh, yeah, next slide. Uh, so uh, you know we, we've been doing pavement condition indexes, uh, PCI scoring for our roads for decades. Um, you know, basically having like an annual assessment as to 
which roads are most uh, most damaged, most need, need, need repair. And these wind up having um, an impact on how we decide on which roads to repave and resurface on an annual basis. Uh, so we do this index, I want to say, like in the fall every year. And then we basically review, review, review the data and then we start repaving streets sometime in the spring. Uh, so this is kind of like an annual thing that's been, been going on for so long. Uh, and we decided to, you know, based on the success of this and, you know, all the positive feedback that we received from Arlingtonians, uh, we've decided to expand this to our trail system. Uh, and so these these scorings are basically just uh, measuring like the, the level of distress, level of damage along uh, surfaces of, of asphalt. And uh, they're based on you know, a metric of zero to 100, with zero being like the, the lowest, 100 being the best. Uh, next slide. So this is an example of uh, from the Wisconsin DOT of what we mean by PCI scoring. Uh, so you know, you know, in the top left corner, you see a PCI of 100, which is it's like you know the smoothest possible asphalt surface you can imagine. So smooth you could probably sleep on it. But then when you go down to the lower scales, the bottom right corner, for example, is uh, an asphalt surface that is heavily damaged with heavily cracking and crowning, uh, and it's definitely needed of resurfacing. Uh, next slide. Uh, so we started applying this to our trail network. Uh, we basically used the same contractor we did for the roadway PCI scoring. Uh, for the first time we did this was in 2018. And we reviewed about 24 miles of trails in the county. So even though we maintained 35 uh, miles, only 24 were measured, uh, since you know there's some uh, areas that are pretty inaccessible for vehicles, uh, some areas that have like you know low bridges that prevent uh, vehicles from, from accessing them. And uh, with, with the first go around, we used a uh, the same contractor to basically use laser modeling to detect imperfections along the surface. And then uh, we, we, we started doing this on a four-year rolling basis. Uh, so then, then the last one we did was in 2022. And this time we went with a different set of contractors to um, to measure that and measure imperfections by foot and by by vehicle, by like you know, four wheelers. Um, yeah, keep in mind, like a lot of this is just like, you know, measuring imperfections along the surface. We're not doing any kind of like digging up the, of the trail network or doing any kind of like um, subsurface studies or anything like that. So this picture is an example of, uh, of an assessment we did back in 2022. And I believe the person sitting under the trees, Bob, actually, um, I'm not sure if you remember, but yes. So we had contractors and we also had uh, county staff out there uh, measuring uh, the surfaces. Next slide. Uh, so these are just some examples of things that we're looking for. Uh, it might be a little hard to see in the loft, but there's some crowning happening. Uh, there's cracks along the edges, uh, and then on the on the right, you see some uh, some issues with expansion joints affecting the, the quality of the trail. Uh, so these things tend to be some some of the most recurring issues that we've noticed during the past two two, two times where we've reviewed those surfaces. Uh, next slide. Okay, so we collect all of this data. What 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 does it mean? What do, what do we do with this? Uh, basically, like we we determined that of the twenty four miles that we studied, twenty two miles are asphalt, and which had a, high, a score of about seventy seven, uh, which is which is falls within like the good range. Uh, and we also measure like uh, the surfaces for concrete and pavers, which are in smaller amounts, but they, they do exist as part of our trail network. And on the right side, you'll we'll see like a summary of how um, mileage of how much is good and how much is you know excellent, fair, and poor. Uh, and those colors correspond to the next map on, on the next slide. <clears throat> so as you, as you can see, the uh, the vast majority of the trail network that we measured and studied uh, falls within the the good range, which is green. And green. Uh, and then there's some segments that are you know, are, are, you know fair and, and some in poor state. Uh, but keep in mind that this is like a snapshot in time from 2022. And since then, we, we've repaved a number of these surfaces. So hopefully in the next two years, when we do another analysis, we'll see more blue uh, on the maps. Uh, yeah, next slide. <clears throat> so this is kind of like a uh, under the hood, like the, the, the side of the, the trail index that we see uh, as county staff. And uh, we, we do have, uh, if you click on any segment that we have, in, in our in our mapping tools, uh, you can measure like the the amount of surface that is is on the ground, 
its condition the last time it was inspected. We, we even collect uh, video recordings of each each segment that was that was reviewed, um, and we do this on the back end. But then we also have this information now available for public view that I could share with you guys later. Um, yeah, next slide. And uh, this data has already been such a uh, game changer for us, and we're, we're starting to use this um, this scoring to to implement a lot of our other plans and, and, and uh, studies. Uh, so for example, we just completed a new, a new study for the Custis Trail, which runs parallel to I-66 from the Key Bridge, which leads to Georgetown, DC, all the way out to the western edge of the county. And uh, we, we, the, the scoring from the PCI index basically helped us get a better understanding of the quality of the trail and helped us to craft recommendations uh, for improving the trail surface and, and its width. And we're we're in the process of updating our bicycle comfort level map, uh, which basically is um, basically just a, a mapping tool that we use to then incorporate you know uh, re real life um, conditions on the ground for bike lanes in a bike lane network, um, based off you know um, things like elevation changes or slopes or uh, level of traffic stress. And now that we have this robust data from from the PCI index, now that's being factored into how we uh, level, uh, how we measure level of comfort for our bikeway networks. And uh, the, the new bike, the comfort map will be more dynamic. To, it'll be more of a, like a, a breathing uh, website where uh, folks can see real-time changes as opposed to just having like a once a year PDF that comes out, you know. Uh, yeah, next slide. Uh, yeah, so just to summarize like some lessons that, that we've learned over the past few years, uh, the PCI studies of our trail network has helped us get a better understanding of what's out on the ground there today. It, helped us, it helps us with prioritizing resources, and it helps us uh, identify what er so which segments of trails are most in need of repaving or servicing. And uh, we were expected to do this every four years, uh, so our next review is in 2026. Um, a lot of this came about from our trail modernization program. So the funding for this uh, is pretty minuscule compared to like you know, other needs that we have. Um, but it, it, the, the data is pretty powerful in terms of helping us understand uh, which segments are most need, needed for surfacing. Um, so yeah, the last uh, review we did was in 2022. Uh, we had an average score of about 78, which is pretty good. Um, it's compared to like our roadway PCI, which is 83 uh, as of last November. So it's pretty consistent in terms of, you know, trying to deliver as, as much quality um, infrastructure as possible. Uh, obviously, a score of 100 would be, would be awesome, but you know we can we can only do the best that we can with the resources we have available. And we've we've found uh, our trail services tend to last way longer than our roadway services, which you know shouldn't be surprising since there's not that many vehicles on, or you know vehicles tend to have more wear and tear for our roadway services than the trails, which normally just have um, people you know walking and rolling and biking. Uh, and we found that uh, over the course of the few the past few years that. Uh, tree roots tend to be the biggest factor in terms of what causes our trails to degrade over time. And this is starting to have an effect as to how we uh, you know, plan future, the planting future street trees and how we plan to, to widen uh, any trail segments that may be too narrow, things like that. Um, next slide. Uh, yes, so if you guys have any more information, have any more questions or about, if, you, if you'd like more information about how we, we determine the scoring uh, we have this uh, web tool, which is uh, on the top, uh, which gives you like an actual, you know, GIS site that gives you all the data that, that we reviewed the, over the last uh, two years. And then we also have uh, our public spaces and national plan if you want to take a look for, as to how we prioritize and what goals we have for, for our, our trail network. Uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. Uh, next slide. Yeah, if you guys have any questions, I'd be happy to answer anything. Yeah, I can Thanks say that. Um, let's see. Any any immediate questions out there? Hey, thanks for the presentation. This is really interesting um, and a, a great project. I'm glad to hear your trails are in such good condition. Um, just want to say I don't have any immediate questions right now, but I expect to have some in the future, so I'm taking your contact information as we 
uh, embark on a, on a trails plan. So thank you. Yeah, for sure. I was interested, are all the trails managed by one department or is it like Parks and Rec has some, Department of Public Works manages some, DOT some, or is it just one department that is kind of managing them all? Depends on the trail. Um, the off-street trails, Parks and Recreation manages. Um, there are some on-street trails that uh, our Department of Environmental Services manages those. Um, we also, so we, because of this, because we have this joint um, kind of ownership and management uh, um, uh, system, we have a trails coordination team. Elwyn and I are both on that team. So it, it brings people from um, DES transportation along with parks and recreation together to uh, kind of plan and coordinate uh, um, uh, uh, work on our trails. Um, we had not done, Parks and Recreation had not done a lot of uh, repaving of our trails um, until until 2018. Um, I've been with the department for almost 28 years. And until 2018, I don't recall us ever milling and paving trails. But in 2018, when we did the um, user satisfaction survey and and realized that um, our trails are loved by our Arlington users, um, uh, you know, those in Arlington and outside Arlington passing through, um, commuting into the district, et cetera, um, we realized we should take advantage of this, and we did. That's when we created a, a trail um modernization program because we figured, you know, with, with this data, we can get more funding. We can get funding to, to upgrade uh, our trails. So that's when that program uh, was born. Uh, the, the, the data does help us prioritize our, our funding. So on the most recent map of uh, uh, the trail segments, those, those segments in orange, that were rated poor, um, we took care of those in 2022. The, um, the uh, um, assessment was done in July and August. Once we, re we received that uh, report that year, that fall, we went ahead and repaved the uh, segments in poor condition. Uh, my own goal, Coming from my my little competitive nature is I want to be better than than our streets. I want our average PCI to be above streets, and it it, it makes sense to me because on our trails we have small wheeled um, uh, devices being used, skateboards and scooters, uh, wheelchairs and road bikes. So. Uh, it makes sense to me that we should be at or above what our um, street PCI is. And we, we're not quite there, but we're, we're getting close and hopefully getting better. Thank you. I was curious what, what software that was they were using for that kind of your um, internal data tracking I don't know. Um, I, I I don't know what it is. And Elwin, do you know? Um, it, it, it's something that came from our our contractor. Um, uh, for the public, we we um, we took out the video. For for what you saw there, um, you and what I can do is I can click on any segment and I can see the video. Um, we did take that out. Um, I'm actually driving the county vehicle that you saw in that picture. And we pass other trail users and it, it, it just didn't feel right to um, put this all out. So uh, the public can click on any segment and see the score for that segment. Um, and other information, the length of the segment, et cetera. Um, but 
they don't have uh, privilege to the videos. And they, by the way, they, the length of the segment was determined, um, well, it had to be, uh, the contractor uses GIS. So um, our GIS people had to go, cartographers had to go in and break the trail up into approximately 100 foot segments because we're going to go out and mill and pave and we won't go out and mill and pave a 10 foot section, but we will a hundred feet, you know? So a hundred feet sort of seemed like the smallest segment that uh, we would mill and pave. So uh, that's the the measure that was used for, um, for the various segments. Yeah, so it seems like, oh, go ahead. Yeah, like a lot of this uh, analysis is done through the ASTM which is like a, a national organization that has uh, standards for uh, the, the smoothness of pavement. And it, it's more of like a survey that gets filled out. It's not really like a technology. I mean, you, you could have like the lasers, which makes it easier to gauge like, you know, the bubble surfaces and whatever, but it's more so like a checklist of, of you know, vi visuals of how the surface looks. And I could share that in the chat as well. I will tell you that the uh, in 2018, the company that uh, did the trail pavement uh, assessment used a van, a specially equipped van with uh, lasers kind of hanging off the side, um, some above. And that van um, with all this apparatus hanging on it could not get beneath some of our bridges. Um, the uh, along the stream, four mile run stream, there are some bridges uh, on the streets that the trail passes beneath the street uh, at the sort of stream level. And the um, there was uh, the van was limited to portions of the of the trail that they could um, access. So this time it was uh, used the company that. Uh, that actually physically walked the trail and also uh, used a, uh, uh, a four wheel drive uh, gator kind of uh, uh, machine to video the trails, but we could get to a lot more of the trail. Gotcha. Of our trail system. Um, one more question. Do, do you capture the, the condition of the striping as well, or other kind of thermoplastic, um, you know, sharrows or whatever wayfinding might be on the pavement. Is that captured as well in the condition index? It is not. It is not. So the, uh, the pavement condition index is um, something through AST. Is it ASTM, L1? I think you put the, the uh, reg in there. So it, it is a, a standard uh, ASTM is the American Society for Testing it and Materials. So they've developed this standard, um, same as is used on streets and roadways. Um, so it, it is a it is a national standard um, uh, that is used uh, for this. But no, it does not bring in is uh, consider uh, striping. We do okay. we do typically stripe put a center stripe uh, uh, on our trails. Yeah, for uh, for striping and wayfinding and, you know, assessing trail amenities and things like that, it's more so uh, on a case-by-case -case basis. Like we, we require, like, mm -hmm. separate studies for individual trails since there's so much variation. Right, we just did one for the Custis Trail. That, was, that just finished last month. And we also completed one for the Arlington Boulevard Trail, which I believe completed last year. And one gotcha. quick question with the bicycle comfort level, you said you included slope in that analysis. How did you get your slope data? That's a good question. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure. Uh, it's, I think a lot of that is, um, I, think, I believe we have a consultant that mm -hmm. you know, works with us for our bike arts and group, which is uh, more of like a contracting group. Uh, and it's more so, um, geared towards you know uh that's just a really good question 
Yeah, it's it's more so just measuring like at the steepness of the, the slopes. It's not really determining specifics. Uh, I don't think we're that detailed yet. But we're getting better. But I, I can follow up with you. That's, that's a really good question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. All right. Well, if there are no more questions, um, I just want to thank um, Ellen and Robert again for joining us. Um, definitely an interesting initiative. I think we'll probably all try to emulate. Um, so thanks for being here. Um, we're going to move on to the next presentation, which is from um, our old friend Shane Sarver, um, who's now at MDOT SHA. Uh, we'll be talking about bike and pedestrian priority areas um, that SHA has, has completed. So, Shane, are you there? I'm here. Thanks, Eric. Sure. Um, so like I said, I'm Shane Sarver. I'm a bicycle and pedestrian planner at State Highway Administration. Um, and I'm going to talk to you about bicycle and pedestrian priority areas. Um, you can go to the next slide. So a bicycle and pedestrian priority area is a designation made by SHA working with local jurisdictions in areas that have a high potential for bi bicycling and walking. Um, uh, these areas are this designation is in areas where the local jurisdiction is also, also has a strong commitment to bicycling and walking and subject to resource availability, we will lead and fund development of a BPPA plan uh, in partnership with our local jurisdictions. Um, when I say subject to resource availability, we will likely this cycle be doing one BPA plan. Um, so these, the BPAs are really meant to coordinate uh, with state and local private stakeholders, align state and local planning goals, um, and look at more innovative ways uh, to improve bicycle and pedestrian accessibility and safety in areas. Um, while we do fund, lead and fund the development of the plan, uh, the state won't fund, will not be funding any capital improvement projects related to it. Um, this, uh, this would not supersede existing bicycle and pedestrian guidelines or existing plans or goals. Um, and we can designate a BPPA that doesn't have any state roadways. If we do, we won't uh, lead or fund the development of the plan. Uh, next slide. So the plan includes working closely with local and other stakeholder partners, um, planning bicycle and pedestrian improvements based on stakeholder input, local plans, master plans, looking at roadway improvements, operational recommendations to, uh, to improve bicycle and pedestrian safety and accessibility, and then estimating construction costs. I'll put um, a link in the chat as well um, to the BPPA website, and there's a few uh, existing plans on there if you're interested in taking a look at those. Um, and we will be working really closely with lo the local agency on this. Um, so leaning on them to uh, find the stakeholders, um, coordinate with local community stakeholders, looking at outcomes and, and really moving forward with the, with the BPPA after it's developed. Uh, next slide. So the program timeline will be accepting applications between September and October this year, um, making the designation, any designations and choosing where we will do the plan by the end of the year, developing the plan um, the first half of next year. And then next year, the timeline is going to be a little bit different. We'll be accepting applications May, June to, to align with the fiscal year a little bit better. Um, next slide. So what we're looking for, a BPPA is going to be an area that has a high potential for bicycling and walking. Uh, so urban areas, main streets, tourist centers, um, usually a pretty focused area, half mile radius somewhere that has surmountable obstacles to bicycling and walking. 
emphasizing multimodal transportation. So we look at transit or trail networks, things like that. Uh, areas that proactively address equity. And then we're really looking for uh, local commitment to bicycling and walking in this area. So if this is a, an area that's in a comprehensive plan or a bike ped plan, uh, something like that, that just shows that priority letter, something that really shows the local commitment to this area as well. And I think that's the last slide. Yeah, so I'm happy to answer any questions. Thanks a lot, Shane. Um, Thank you. Actually, I had a quick question, Shane. Are there any BPPAP areas in the Baltimore region or? There are not. There are, I think, 13 existing, um, most of which are in Montgomery County. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Shane, could you, could you say again, you may have already mentioned it, how the, the list of sites that are already on the website, how those were selected? So those were all selected before I was here. So I'm not sure all of the details. Um, I didn't, this, the application has not substantially changed. Um, mm -hmm. In the past, when this year I didn't substantially change it. Um, I think a big holdup in the past and the reason that Montgomery County has so many is, is that that local commitment and part of having it being part of a bike ped plan um, having that area being specifically called out by the county where one there's um, Montgomery County is just kind of a little bit ahead of everyone else in, in that area. And also, uh, so there's a lot more, now there's a lot more local bike ped plans that are calling out specific areas. Um, and we're also kind of taking a slightly looser interpretation of that rule this, this year to allow for it whereas in the past it specifically had to be a, a bicycle and pedestrian priority area locally designated whereas this year we're kind of taking a little bit more of a loose interpretation of that requirement gotcha um follow-up question it looks like the ones that are on that list are kind of district scale um not specific corridors is that intentional or just, um, you know, if, if we were to apply with just a specific corridor, would that put us at a disadvantage or are you looking for kind of a district type area? I think a, a corridor would be okay as long as it's not a very long corridor, as long as it kind of mm -hmm. keeps within that half mile to a mile size. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. All right. Anyone else out there have uh, questions? All right. Your job's easy. Um, today. Well, thanks for being here, Shane. Thank you. Um, appreciate it. Um, all right, we're on to our third presentation for today. Um, happy to have Meg Young here um, to present on the, the complete streets policy um, that has just been rolled out by um, M.SHA. So look forward to hearing about this. Great, thanks, Eric. Um, can you all hear me all right? The air conditioner just popped on over here. Okay. Um, as Eric said, my name is Meg Young. I am with MDOT's Secretary's Office in the Office of Active Transportation and Micromobility. Um, and we are really excited for this updated Complete Streets Policy, which was just signed into effect on June 1st. Next slide. So for today, I wanted to go over a few things. I'll breeze through what Complete Streets are, because I think everybody in this group probably knows what they are at this point. Um, go over a little bit about our updated policy, uh, what you can expect in the next six months, which is our implementation timeframe um, to get the ball rolling, 
And then we do have a new website and contact information um, that everybody can share out. Next slide. So complete streets, a deliberate approach to planning, designing, and constructing streets to be safe for all users. Again, a lot of you probably know a lot about complete streets already, but the things I would emphasize about our updated complete streets policy is the process. The process under that we are going to undertake under the new policy um, has a lot more checks to make sure that we are designing for all roadway users um, and a different process for a waiver if you are deciding not to build for a particular user. The other thing I would emphasize is that it's a context sensitive network. Some people think that a complete street means that there might be a bike lane on every road and that can get communities up in arms if they you know, are view an arterial as a, as a place where uh, motor vehicles should be prioritized. Um, and that's not the case. You know, Not every road is going to look the same under a complete streets policy. It's about having a network for each mode. So there should be a network for people on bike to reach important destinations, but it doesn't mean that every road has a bike lane. And it was an interesting conversation when we were working through some of the policy elements for this um, policy that applies to all MDOT modes because it applies to all modes. The Port Authority said, what, you know, what are we gonna do with a complete streets policy? We need to oversee the port. Um, but if it hasn't been underscored enough lately with the collapse of the bridge, getting goods to communities is a huge role that the port plays. And we need to have a network for freight too. Um, so complete streets really needs to apply for all. And again, make sure that all important places in a community can be reached no matter what mode uh, a person, a business um, is choosing to use. Next slide. And so our updated complete streets policy um, applies to all modes. And then the other thing that we are doing all this outreach for and working with uh, MPOs like BMC for is to make sure that our policy can work with local policies. Um, Smart Growth has an animation, I guess it didn't come through on this, this is a PDF, um, but since 2000, uh, 37 states have rolled out complete streets policies, but this bigger number, there's 1,700 complete streets policies across the United States. And Maryland is going to pop up because all of our, many of our local jurisdictions also have complete streets policies. And so over the next six months, we're going to be doing a lot of outreach like this to make sure where a state route intersects a local road, uh, we can understand how the policies work together. Um, and I will give a shout out for Chris from Howard County, he's not here. I think someone else from here from Howard County. Um, they were the first complete streets policy to get a perfect score from Smart Growth America. Um, so it was a huge inspiration to ours uh, as well. We took some elements from their policy. Um, but yeah, we have to make sure that our policy works with the local policies as well and understands, especially at the intersections how they can work in concert to achieve the same goal of networks and, and safety. Next slide. So here in Maryland, next slide, this is an updated policy. And the impetus for it was largely the Moore Miller State Plan. Um, our current governor and administration has put a bigger emphasis on accessible transportation for all residents bringing back the red line, um, advancing infrastructure that will connect all Maryland, Marylanders to opportunities. Um, and this last one in particular, making Maryland a leader in clean energy and the greenest state in the country. Um, we've now adopted a motto in our office to also be the greenest DOT in the country. Um, so we're making a lot of strides um, to also include you know, electric vehicles in our networks. Um, but you can see it reflected a lot in the, the uh, Maryland transportation plan as well, putting safety first for all Maryland residents, reducing disparities, creating a safe multimodal network, um, and to maintain a safe system during emergencies. 
So when we look at all of these directives, it was pretty clear we needed to update our guiding policy to meet all of these goals. Next slide. So I keep saying it's an updated policy because we have had a complete streets policy at MDOT, but the one passed in 2012 only applied to the State Highway Administration. Um, there were a number of waivers and uh, safety performance functions were taken from uh, SHA's business plans, mobility and safety. In contrast, the policy that was just signed into effect applies to all capital improvements in the MDOT right of way. Again, the Port Authority signed on, MTA signed on, MDTA signed on. Um, so it's going to affect a lot more than the previous policy. Um, exceptions require a lot more documentation when the planning process would not plan for all modes. Um, and the safety performance functions are a lot more aggressive um, and in partnership with the Maryland Highway Safety Office and the Strategic Highway Safety Plan. So it's trying to actually combine, you know, state highway that oversees infrastructure with what we're seeing out of Maryland Highway Safety Office, which is trying to affect behavior and create a cultural change for safety as well um, to make sure we're approaching this from all angles. Um, you know, we can build a complete street, but we also have to teach people how to use it. Um, and with this policy, uh, that would be taken into consideration. Next slide. A few of the key elements that have been updated under this policy, um, public involvement, uh, will be working to update SHA's public involvement handbook and um, applying it to all modes. Our objective project statements, uh, I like to think of this as kind of building a consensus at the beginning of a project. So you don't have arguments down the line. If you know safety and the users from the beginning uh, and everyone comes to agreement with that, um, it's gonna help us uh, achieve our goals for a roadway project. There's a lot more requirements for safety and performance. Um, we are doing a lot more data informs crash modification factors when approaching design. Um, and last but not least, we're improving our multimodal data. Um, we rolled out the level of traffic stress for bicycling a few years ago. And right now we are also looking at compiling the sidewalk data collaboration across the state. We should have sidewalk data across the entire state, state roads, as well as local jurisdictions, and using that to actually be able to forecast and think of all modes the way that we have so much data around motor vehicles to expand that to people biking and walking as well. Next slide. So, signed into effect on June 1st, but becomes effective January 1st, 2025. Right now we're in the stage of implementation. Next slide. So over the next six months, we are working to, towards these outcomes, consistency and consolidation of all of our manuals and standards, um, highlighting and updating what our key decision points are, taking a more user-focused approach and working that into all of our, our policies. We're taking a look at structures and crossings and where there are network gaps currently. Uh, we're looking at sharing across agencies, so coordination between SHA and MTA and MVA, making sure we're all looking at the same standards and the same policies. Um, as well as doing this outreach to local agencies to make sure that our uh, processes and, and standards are transparent. And then we're really looking to make the change, increase engagement um, with users and local partners as we're developing plans um, like the bicycle and pedestrian priority areas, for example. Next slide. So the next six months, we have a little bit of a heavy lift. Um, by January 1st, the new Complete Streets of policy, policy will apply to all roadway projects uh, that have not reached uh, a NEPA phase if there's federal funding involved. And so we have 
a lot to do. Um, each mode is currently working on their implementation plan to revise guidance, standards, manuals, policies, and other documents to make sure everything complies with complete streets. And what you'll see with that down the line is that for different standards, uh, each mode is supposed to compile stakeholders. So when we are getting to revising our context-driven manual, I suspect people from this group will be tapped to, to help us um, make sure we're revising it in, in the right way. We are updating our decision-making processes, as I mentioned. Uh, modifying approaches for measuring performance. Uh, I'll get to that in, in a minute when we're talking about uh, the workshop I'm at today um, and some, some projects we have underway to really take a data-informed approach um, to crash modification factors. Uh, we are collaborating during implementation um, and working on providing ongoing education and training uh, this new policy is going to be the guiding policy for all MDOT employees, uh, not just engineers, not just uh, people who are making policy, but everyone down to the clerk at the MVA needing to understand uh, the importance of safety when they're giving somebody their driver's license. Um, so we're gonna be providing a lot of ongoing education and training um, from new employee orientation for all MDOT employees um, to in-depth training that we're rolling out in partnership with FHWA for some of our key employees um, and partners. So it really is going to be a huge culture shift and not something that's one and done. Um, part of our implementation plan is going to be how we have ongoing education about complete streets and um, the, the importance of safety in all of our projects. Next slide. So for the next six months, while we're waiting for this to take effect, um, we have what we're calling the Model Complete Streets Initiative, which I like to think of as kind of a, a soft launch of some of these tactics. Um, the Pedestrian Safety Action Plan, uh, Shane and his office have been working really hard on this, uh, is a data-informed approach to doing safety interventions in our five locations across the state that have the most uh, severe and fatal crashes involving pedestrians. So you're gonna be hearing more and more about that over the fall as we start outreach for those corridors. And where I am right now uh, is a workshop for the Complete Streets Leadership Academy. Uh, this is a quick build pilot program we're doing in partnership with Smart Growth America. Uh, right now, we're working with Hagerstown, the town of Bel Air, and Howard County for quick build projects on state roads within their city or our county. So they got to choose a place where they said, you know, this is a state road. We didn't get to design it, but we see day in and day out that there are safety issues. And so we are, we are working on designing temporary projects that are going to be in the ground for three months with a lot of data collection. And if some of these countermeasures are effective, some of them are going to become permanent. And there's things that we haven't necessarily tried before, but with this academy, we have our SHA districts in the room with the SHA uh, chief strategy officer, along with the local jurisdictions and Smart Growth America, who is pushing us to try new things. Um, so it's been really great to hear the conversations back and forth um, things like, you know, do we really need to have this turn lane so wide for an 18 wheeler or could we tell them to go make the turn at the next block down if this is a school crossing? Um, and it's a conversation where a district engineer says, well, we always have to accommodate freight. And they say, well, that is accommodating them to let them know that there's a wider turning radius the next block down. You know, as long as we communicate it effectively and we're gathering data during this time period, um, we can see if it works. And if it does, make it permanent to guarantee that safer passage for the kids getting to school as well. Um, so we're trying new things um, and hope to be able to do this in a couple other places around the state um, in the second academy um, soon. 
some of these other things I've already mentioned, we're working on our sidewalk data partnership. Um, and the reason I was interested in the uh, Arlington uh, presentation was we're rolling out a statewide trails plan soon. Um, so a lot of things coming together um, in the next six months, working towards uh, our complete streets update. Next slide. So we have a new website. I can put it in the chat as well, but we have a complete streets page that has FAQ and we're kind of adding more and more to it every day. Um, links to the Complete Streets Leadership Academy are being added as we're rolling out the websites for each project. Um, and then we also have a new email address, complete streets at mdot.maryland.gov. And I think that's my last slide, but very willing to take any questions or see what people think. Uh, any places where you know we need to do outreach, I will take invitations as well for that. John, Thanks so much, man. I think I had the first question here. Go for it. Yeah, sure. So um, cool. So I just want to say uh, thanks for the presentation. Um, I know that you said that you reached out to places like Howard County and other in the state. Uh, as you know, we passed our policy in 2018. And I was wondering if you know of any of the biggest similarities to our um, ordinance that you have at HEMDOT. Ooh. I think what I like about the Baltimore city policy is the streets, the street typology. And that in a lot of ways is reflected um, in our context driven guide. So it's kind of the same thing uh, with some different terminology, John. Um, whereas, yeah, Baltimore city, you have each, each typology laid out in the complete streets manual. That's what we have in our, in our context driven as well. So again, emphasizing that like not every street is the same. It's based on the street typology or it's based on that, that context. Okay. Um, yeah, I think that's probably the biggest similarity. Um, yeah. And I was also showing off the Baltimore City Complete Streets uh, Policy Manual YouTube. If people haven't seen it, it's a really short minute and a half video and uh, we're rolling out some videos and, and graphics like that as well. But for people who don't know exactly what complete streets are or how it impacts them, the Baltimore City video is really good. All right. Um, Tanya, did you have a comment? I think you I have a question, yeah. Um, has there been any um, discussions about the size of emergency vehicles and, um, you know, slowly but surely replacing fleets with smaller vehicles that don't require such large turning radiuses. And, you know, we often hear, oh, the fire department says we have to do this and they're, they're the gospel, but um, it would be nice if, if they had smaller vehicles. <laughs> yeah. Um... I've heard similar conversations um, in Baltimore City, for example. Um, and when we were approaching these quick builds, we were talking with the town of Bel Air who had that concern um, about a turning radius and making sure that they weren't interfering with the, the fire department's route. Um, in terms of actually pushing them towards smaller vehicles, I can't speak to that uh, at the moment. I can I can look into uh, if the MBA has had any discussions like that. But that's one of the exciting things about having them signed on is they're yeah. the ones who you know set set the vehicle code. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. I guess I would just say yeah, may, maybe keep that in the conversation. Mm -hmm. with all oh of my it. gosh, I have so many plans to involve the MBA. <laughs> <laughs> and that goes for things like speed humps too. I mean, um, you know, again, the fire department doesn't like them very much, um, but we're talking about, you know, seconds of a response time difference, you know, not minutes. Um, so I've even heard fire and emergency people saying, you know, 
overall, the safety of the people using the roadways is probably more important than the one emergency that they're losing five seconds to respond to. Yeah, hopefully it means they have to respond to fewer emergencies. Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Taking that note to see if I can, um, if there have been any preliminary discussions about that. It's a great point. Meg, as these implementation plans are developed with the different departments where there'll be a, a kind of public outreach component or involvement with the local jurisdictions? Yeah, so we kicked that off with a policy audit um, at the beginning of the year um, that our office led where we looked at all of the policies and manuals and kind of prioritize them based on how much they'd be impacted um, by the Complete Streets update. And so for each one, there's going to be some outreach. And an example of that is um, traffic impact studies that SHA requires from developers on state roads. Um, there, that one came up as a high priority. Um, and we've had a couple meetings about it and they're building like a list of stakeholders of, of major developers um, along state routes. So anything like that, where there's gonna be substantial changes where it was ranked as, as, as you know, a big impact or a lot of different things were going to change in that manual or guidance, um, there's gonna be a list of stakeholders who they expect to run those changes by and make sure that they're aware of what's changing under the policy. Thank you. Tanya, coming back for more. Yep. <laughs> um, so you mentioned the the three jurisdictions that I think I guess what you're doing is sort of piloting some of these quick builds. Um, mm -hmm. Are you going to be doing that in all of the jurisdictions over the course of the years to come, or you know, how do we sign on? <laughs> right. Um, there's a lot of talk and a lot of hope right now, so I don't want to overly promise, um, but we're starting out with these three jurisdictions um, that were selected uh, out of our PSAP corridors, our pedestrian safety action plan corridors, and the hope is to do another three jurisdictions soon that are in different SHA districts. Um, and potentially have this be a, a permanent program. Right now, we're really working hand in hand with Smart Growth America, who's done this across the country to learn how it can be done, um, you know, how to report the data you need to, to evaluate the intervention. Uh, but the hopes is that, yes, it could be something that you can just sign on to in, in the future. Great. I I have a question that you, you can um, choose to answer diplomatically, I guess, but it, I, I tend to see the district level folks as kind of uniform, you know, and, you know, not particularly historically not focused on complete street thinking. Um, are, are there districts in the state that you think are more, you know, ahead of the game or kind of, you know, have already been sort of laying the groundwork for this? Um, or are they all kind of at the same place, you know, in terms of starting to adapt to a different way of doing things? Some diplomacy in here. Um, I'm still learning our districts, to be honest. Yeah. Uh, you know, I've, I've been at MDOT uh, for about six months at this point in time, and that has been the biggest thing for me to learn is how they all operate. And that is somewhat of an issue is because they do operate all a little differently. And so part of this policy is definitely going to be more consistency across the board. Um, but this needs to be a culture shift for all of the districts um, so that you're not running into hesitancies for complete streets. If this is like the code that we have to follow. Um, I expect you'll be running into that less and less. And it's one of the reasons why it has to be, again, like ongoing training and developed into the processes. And so for the SHA implementation plan, um, we do have somebody who is uh, working with each of the districts to make sure that their policies are all being uh, updated. Gotcha. All right, thank you. Yeah, that was a loaded question. Um, 
This is really exciting. I, I'm definitely thrilled to see. I was, I was trying to figure out like why, now, you know, when the news broke about it, I was like, why now? And I, it, it does make sense that it's kind of consistent with our, um, our governors and lieutenant governors. Think, yeah, we have a different administration that really believes in transportation and access for, for everyone. Um, and yeah, I think that again, is the big, is the big impetus. Um, and that's even coming down from the federal level right now. Um, so yeah, it was, it was time for an update. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks for being here, joining from Hagerstown, um, live from Hagerstown. Um, well, um, yeah, I'm sure you'll get some follow-up comments, but yeah, that was great. Um, well, we're we're at the the last part of our agenda now, um, the roundtable discussion, where each um, member shares updates on things they're working on, um, and we just go jurisdiction by jurisdiction or, or participant by participant. Um, starting with me, um, City of Annapolis. So. Um, um, not, not much new to report. Uh, we just continue to plug away at our multiple signature funded grant funded projects that, um, have all received funding from Maryland state bikeways program. And we're really getting several of them are in the grading permit phase. We're getting comments back. We're kind of in the getting closer towards, um, construction. So, um, the West East Express, our Hilltop Lane connector, and our College Creek connector. Um, um, we passed our comprehensive plan last week, which was really exciting. It's been a four-year project. And there's a ton of a ton of um, goals and recommended actions in that towards equitable mobility, bike ped connectivity. Um, that's really one of the biggest themes in the in the comprehensive plan. So I'm really excited to have gotten that through. It was approved unanimously by our city council, and um, I think it's going to give us a good plan to advance um, mobility in the city. Um, I think that's that's it from my end. Um, Anne Arundel County. Oh, um, yeah, that's Tanya. Uh, so we are just sort of in the throes of what is no longer grant season, but it's just a year long ongoing grant application process. They just keep coming fast and furious. We've got a lot out there. Um, and then we did win. We did learn that we won the Maryland Highway Safety Office grant. It's a small grant to continue the um, safe routes to school type um uh, safety training, bicycle safety training in uh, nine more elementary schools. We did it last year in eight that had been identified in our uh, transportation master plan. So we'll be carrying that out next school year um, for elementary schools in grades three through five. It was a very popular and well received um, program. So happy that we got that money. Um, I think the WBNA trail is the Patuxent Bridge crossing the Patuxent is supposed to be done this year. It seems like it's moving along nicely. So hopefully uh, I'll be announcing uh, the um, ribbon cutting soon. Hopefully we, you can all come. <laughs> um, and Cindy, uh, yeah, that was fiscal year 25 funding from MHSO, Cindy Spriggs. Um, what else? There, the Crownsville Hospital um is they're undergoing the um discussions about what to do with it how to design it we just had a meeting about traffic today earlier um so stay tuned for what's coming there they're gonna make sure that it has connections to the south shore trail which is going to run very close to it um we just keep plugging along on vision zero i, I can't remember if i mentioned to this group but we do have a, a dashboard now that is our Vision Zero dashboard. It's um, pretty nice. It's got like all kinds of data in there and a link to our implementation plan, um, which is kind of high level right now, but it's we're gonna be drilling down on it in the next couple of months. 
Um, and we're, we are beginning to carry out a lot of those programs. We already were doing some of them, um, but now we're you know, able to see on paper what we need to keep doing. And um, so that's good. Um, I can't think of anything else at the moment. All right. Well, thanks a lot, Tanya. Um, Baltimore City? Yeah, sure. So um, one of our major priorities here at the uh, Department of Transportation for Baltimore City is we are doing the four segments of the Green Ray Trails. Um, that's kind of what a main priority for us. Uh, we have project managers for each segment of that. Of, of that. Um, then also going forward, we are um, re-kicking off our phase two of the Wolf in Washington cycle track project. Um, and then after that, we are, we're also re-kicking off um, our Utah Place uh, project also. And uh, yeah, that's it, about it for right now. All right, thanks, John. Uh, Baltimore County, anybody from Baltimore County here? Hello, I'm here from Baltimore County. Uh, first, thank you to all the presenters, those were great. And I'll just go through any of the projects I can think of. Since Anne Arundel mentioned Vision Zero, we are currently working on an update to our strategic highway safety plan. And I'm not super involved with that. We have a safety team working on that, but that will lead into a Vision Zero plan after that. Um, we are wrapping up our NCR extension feasibility report, which should be out um, probably end of this month. We have a couple trails that should be to 100% designed by this fall. We have Six Bridges Trail, uh, Northeast Trail, and East West Trail. Um, we have our complete our complete street pilot project on Old Court Road between Mercerstown Liberty that is moving along. We are currently in the concept uh, development section. Then we'll do some public engagement probably in the next couple months to come up with our final concept. And then we have our first protected bike lane project in Pikesville that we are just waiting on the road to be repaved to put that in. So it should happen sometime this year. And that is all I can think of at the moment. That's quite a bit. Thank you, Mitchell. Um, yep. Carroll County, I saw that um, Claire had to leave. I don't know, is there anybody else from Carroll County here? Okay. Um, Harford County? Can anyone hear me? Uh, yeah. Okay, Say right, cool, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I was having connection issues, so I just kind of send a quick message real quick. Um, I don't really have any new updates, um, but we are very uh, excited for the complete streets um, and what that's going to mean for our county and connectivity. Um, so we're very excited for that. All right. Thank you, Tobias. Um, we're up to Howard County. I know Chris is not here today. I don't think there's anybody else. From... Um, yeah, I, I can speak. I'll try to fill in for oh, Chris. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, this is Pat Smith with the Office of Transportation for Howard County. Uh, Chris Thanks. is in Hagerstown for the Complete Streets event. And uh, I know uh, one thing that our uh, office is coordinating, uh, it was going to be in August, but it may be pushed back, uh, was our own Complete Streets workshop, a two-day event uh, to inform um, attendees about <clears throat> the Complete Streets initiatives and design uh, principles in Howard County. I uh, don't have a confirmed date and maybe push back into the fall. I'll have to check with Chris on that, but we're really excited to get that coordinated. Another thing we've been working with is a uh, countywide effort called the Gateway Master Plan for the Gateway area of Howard County. Uh, the master plan uh, development process has, has begun and the transportation portion is uh, something we're helping with. So we've been gathering data uh, in GIS and some uh, traffic data for development projects all around the region of Gateway in Howard County. So we're really excited to see that take off. 
All right. Thank you, Patrick. Um, we're uh, we're up to Queen Anne's County. Steve, you there? Uh, yes. Um, we have, um, as I mentioned before, the uh, South Island Trail extension. Um, that's a two mile extension of an existing trail. Um, it's a phased project, so part of it is under construction, part of it is under permitting, part of it's under design, um, and it'll take about two years to bring all those uh, phases together and have it fully paved. Um, but it is in process, and we are real excited about that. I'm also working with BMC on a land use connections grant to extend our cross county connector trail approximately two miles to the east. Um, that's a trail that parallels US 5301, um, and that would extend to an area that doesn't have a trail system right now. So we're looking forward to um, uh, getting through that feasibility study and moving that forward. And then uh, we're in the um, beginning phases of looking at feasibility of a pedestrian overpass over US 5301. Um, so we're gathering our thoughts and starting those discussions, um, and we'll be looking at uh, um, initiating a feasibility study to, to go over the highway, um, see what our options are um, later this year. So thank you. All right. Thanks a lot, Steve. Um, that's exciting with the Cross Island. Um, MDE, anyone from MDE here? Catherine's here from MDE. Um, I don't think I have any updates for the group. Thank you. All right. I'm glad you could be here. Um, MDP. Anyone from MDP? All right. Um, Highway Safety Office. Anyone from Highway Safety Office? Okay, MTA. No updates at this time. Okay, thank you. Um, SHA. No updates. Okay, thank you. Um, TSO. Hi, Secretary. this is yeah. This is Francine. I <laughs> I heard my name earlier. I feel bad. I was just getting back to the computer um, when I heard it. Um, so I've joined you all and I just wanted to share a couple of updates. So the first update is for the sidewalk data collaboration that Meg had mentioned. Um, we have a number of counties and jurisdictions that have signed up for training. And if you have any questions about it, uh, concerns, would love to uh, sign up, uh, please reach out to me and we'll get you on the list. We are hoping to set up uh, training classes uh, starting uh, in August, and there'll be small classes, so uh, you'll have plenty of opportunity to ask questions uh, at, along the way. Uh, and in addition to that, we are going to be launching our Walktober 2024 campaign, which I'm very excited to announce. Um, and I'm hoping perhaps in the future, I will be able to share with everyone a presentation on what the plans are for this coming uh, Walktober uh, 2024. So um, that is from from my uh, end our updates on the sidewalk data collaboration and on a Walktober 2024. Thanks, Eric. All right, thank you, Francine. Um, last but not least, um, BMC, Charlene. Yeah. Um, so we're still in the midst of the Bikeable Baltimore Region project. Um, the first comment period um, is open till July 26. So I'll put a link in the chat to the project website if you can share it. Um, we held eight in-person public meetings throughout the region, um, in, one in each jurisdiction through the month of June. And then we had two virtual public meetings and had good engagement with that. Um, we've been getting a lot of comments on our project website in the survey um, on the story map, but we always wanna hear from more voices. Um, so the next steps we're doing right now is talking with the steering and advisory committee, trying to identify the criteria that will help select the regional bike network. And then we'll be back out to the public in the fall for that project. Um, for the Patapsco Regional Greenway, Guinness to Southwest Area Park 
30% design project we're working on in collaboration with Baltimore County. We're currently reviewing the 30% design documents for that. So that's exciting, getting closer to the end. Um, and then for the Patapsco Regional Greenway Stony Run segment, 30% design, um, they went out to the public in the spring and um, offered up four different options for trail alignment and got a lot of great feedback from that. So now they're just processing that information and then identifying what would be the selected alignment and they'll be back out to the public in the fall for that one. Um, and one other thing, um, so with the transportation alternatives program, we wanted to kind of get together, brought this up before, but get together some members from BPAC who volunteer to do a little work group where we would meet um, about three times from, you know, around September, or no, sorry, August to around um, November to talk about, you know, what are the locals experience uh, with the TA process, um, lessons learned, if there's any ways that PMC could possibly um, have a role in assistance. Also talking about um, the program has kind of expanded a little more under the bipartisan infrastructure law. So now it's also it's a transportation alternative projects, self safe routes to school projects and recreational trail projects can all be considered under that um, umbrella. So we wanted to talk about with that a limited amount of funding that we get per year, um, do we want to consider all project types, make that recommendation or make a recommendation to um, narrow that? And then we also wanted to get feedback um, from that work group on the kind of the regional scoring for the projects that are submitted and see ways that we can provide clarification or improve that process. So I'll be sending a follow up email <laughs> with all that info and then uh, soliciting volunteers. So thank you so much. And I put links in the chat to the Bikeable Walton Region project and the two um, PRG segments. Yeah, I've been really happy with the way that project has been moving forward. Um, and we just had our steering committee meeting this week, so um, look forward to seeing that keep moving. Um, well, that that pretty much concludes our meeting for today. Um, any other comments for the good of the order um, before we adjourn? All right. Well. Thank you all for joining today. Um, see you at the next meeting.